So welcome to our next uh, batch of concurrent sessions. I'm Dr. Shacoby Wilson um, with the Maryland Institute for Applied Environmental Health, uh, one of the co-organizers co um, of this symposium. Our, this session is entitled Climate Change, Environmental Justice, and Beyond. I'm going to emphasize that the Beyond Community Resilience. Uh, we have Dr. Dr. Marcus Hendricks, who's, um, we have uh, Mr. Omar Muhammad, hopefully Omar's own, we have Kareem Taylor, uh, Vicky Arroyo, and you know Vicky, my, my, my southernness doesn't help me, so <laughs> Ana Batista. Um, so I just want to give a quick, quick introduction of everybody who are in this session. So, oh, a sec, sorry. So Dr. Marcus Hendricks um, is assistant uh, professor uh, in architecture at the University of Maryland School, um, School of Architecture. His interest includes stormwater infrastructure planning and management, from building disaster, environmental justice, hazard mitigation, sustainable development. Uh, he's uh, currently a JPB Environmental Health Fellow. Uh, he's in, in doing really a lot of great work on stormwater management issues and urban flooding in, in the DC area. And he's also uh, a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Just want to say that real quick because we're both alphas. Uh, we have Mr. Omar Muhammad. Uh, Omar has worked as a community advocate and activist uh, since 2007 uh, with the Low Country Alliance for Model Communities. Uh, LAMSI is a community corporation working on environmental justice and health issues in North Charleston, South Carolina. He currently serves as LAMSI's executive director. He also sits on a mitigation work group uh, uh, for LAMSI's mitigation agreement with the South Carolina State's Ports Authority to uh, reduce the impacts of goods, particularly the port expansion on communities of color uh, in North Charleston. We have Kareem Taylor, who is the policy director for Green for All. Uh, uh, she, she also uh, has done work uh, in clean energy leadership and, and does a lot of work speaking uh, at various events, including Afropunk, Broccoli City Fest, uh, the Clean Energy Leadership Institute, Congressional Black Caucus Annual Legislative Conference. Uh, next, we have Ana Baptista. Ana, who I've known since uh, 2005, is an assistant professor of professional practice and the chair of the Environmental Policy Sustainability Management graduate program at the Milano School of International Affairs Management and Urban Policy at the New School uh, University. She also serves as associate director of the Tishman Environment Design Center at the New School. You got a lot of titles, Anna. Um, she's done a lot of work in community-based pieces of research, environmental justice, climate justice, uh, she is a, a senior fellow in the environmental leadership program. She does work with the Ironbound Community Corporation. Uh, she was pivotal and part of the group fighting for the cumulative impacts bill. And Anna is also a recent Addy, recent uh, board member of, for the editor board for the, the premier journal of environmental justice, environmental justice. We have Vicky Arroyo, uh, uh, Vicky, uh, is, is executive director of the Georgetown Climate Center, where she leads work on climate law and policy, supervising staff and student analysis of climate change mitigation, adaptation, supporting leading states and cities in their efforts to address and prepare for climate change. She also serves as a professor of uh, practice at Georgetown uh, University Law Center, where she teaches uh, exper uh, experimental courses. Vicky has been very engaged in, in various levels of government. Uh, she worked uh, Pew Center on Global Climate Change as Vice President of Policy Analysis. Uh, she's done work on U.S. policy programs on, on climate change uh, for over a decade. She's done work with the Transportation Research Board. So Vicky has a long uh, history of working in this space. And I think I'm really excited to have this, this panel today. So the first question, again, the title of this panel, I just went through the long introductions. Uh, our esteemed panelists, but the title of this panel for today is Climate Change, Environmental Justice, and Beyond uh, Community Resilience. So the first question I want to I want to start with. Hold on a second. My questions. So, for each panelist, can you uh, give a brief introduction of who you are? and how your work is related to uh, this topic, climate change, environmental justice, and beyond community resilience. I want to start with uh, Dr. Hendricks, please. Uh, 
Yeah, thanks a lot, Sokovi. Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, I uh, my, my work operates at, at the nexus uh, of environmental planning, hazard mitigation planning, infrastructure planning, and participatory planning. Um, and I operate a, a newly minted research lab, the Stormwater Infrastructure Resilience and Justice Lab. And, you know, out of my lab, we really sort of explore or take a social lens to what has largely been studied as a physical process related to infrastructure, um, environmental outcomes and, and neighborhood forces and how they interact to, to you know, affect everyday lives as well as live, uh, people's lives and communities during um, extreme events. Um, we look at you know, the effects of infrastructure on the environment in terms of preserving natural and green spaces and, and potentially minimizing our carbon footprint. We think about the role of infrastructure and modifying hazard exposures um, and essentially how the type, location, and condition of infrastructure can shape um, a, a community's uh, exposure to environmental hazards and, and shape differential risk across communities. We also think about the design of infrastructure and the placement of infrastructure um, and, and how those uh, things can, you know, set the stage for, you know, justice and other opportunities in terms of climate adaptation. Um, and then obviously, lastly, and most importantly, you know, equity and environmental justice in terms of the provision and management of infrastructure um, and how neighborhoods, you know, have to be accounted for um, and how we might redistribute plans and funding and resources to make sure that marginalized groups are accounted for and supported uh, in the ways that they need and see fit, um, especially as we sort of transition um, toward, uh, I guess, you know, what I hope to be a much more sustainable um, and climate resilient future. Um, and so, you know, most of my work is essentially centered around, you know, stormwater, extreme events, urban flooding, and how those things, you know, have become much more frequent and intense in the role of infrastructure um, through an EJ lens in, in terms of supporting communities to be able to adapt and respond to, to these events. Cool, thank you. Let's go to Kareem. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thanks to Shakobi and the entire UMD folks for inviting me today to speak on this panel. I'm really glad to see some familiar faces here as well. Uh, my work intersects with climate change. So with um, I am the Director of Federal Legislative Affairs for We Act for Environmental Justice. We Act um, is one of the, uh, I think one of the first environmental justice organizations in New York City. And the reason why we even have a DC office is because of climate change legislation. Uh, when Waxman and Markey was being uh, discussed um, back in 2008, 2009, there was just a lot of concern about um, the last minute kind of interaction with environmental justice and community groups in the formation of what would have been a very pivotal pivotal um, climate change policy. And so seeing the need to make sure that environmental justice communities can be a part of the process earlier on, um, I, many of you are familiar with just the importance of meaningful engagement and um, really doing the work in the front end when creating policy for communities or that will impact communities. And so um, my work in Washington, DC is to um, be the eyes and ears, not only for WE Act, but for other organizations who don't have the capacity to be present um, in Washington, D.C. So I'm interacting with members of Congress, um, not so much the EPA right now as the administration is very um, skewed um, away from environmental justice and more towards, I think, um, meeting the acquiescence of uh, industry and just kind of bulldozing over a hundred rules right now. So um, our, our work is to be involved and um, then also bring along other environmental justice organizations to provide their feedback too. We convene the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum, which is a coalition of about 60 organizations in 24 states. And in that role, we're constantly, you know, if we see issues or um, members from different states that are talking about environmental justice, we immediately contact our coalition members in their states to get them involved so that they themselves can also have a role in, in shaping um, whatever legislation might come from that member that, that would impact their state. And I think 
right now what we're seeing, at least on the House side, there is a very strong progressive push to talk more about environmental justice to include, you know, um, a lot of the bills that or a lot of the provisions that we've always been asking for. So when we think about the Environmental Justice for All Act and or the Climate Equity Act, et cetera, a lot of those um, bills reflect the longstanding um, perspectives of EJ groups now that have the platform to reach out to members like Congressman Grijalva or Congressman McEachin or on the Senate side, Cory Booker or Kamala Harris. So um, just trying to be um, present for communities who don't have the same level of access right now. Thank you. Um, Vicki? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I, I hit the wrong button. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Dr. Wilson, can you can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Vicki Arroyo. I'm originally from New Orleans and um, uh, started uh, to want to work on environmental issues from a very young age because of the concentration of chemical plants in Cancer Alley, just upriver of New Orleans. That affected the drinking water of everyone. Um, had my parents drive me to hearings before I could drive and meetings at public library and um, protest and such and studied ecology before there were environmental studies courses in um, school um, to get science degrees and went to the Kennedy School, um, came back from there um, as a student to argue against the dumping a big pounds, piles of gypsum into the river. I don't know if you remember that fight. Some of you might be old enough to remember that. Um, radioactive gypsum in the drinking water in the Mississippi River. Um, and then um, uh, went on to work at EPA in the Office of Air and Radiation on air toxics. That was before the Clean Air Act was reauthorized in 1990. And it was very frustrating because there were very few hazardous air pollutants really regulated at the time at the federal level. So I actually went back home to Louisiana in a reform administration and worked as Governor Buddy Romer's um, first head of the Environmental Agency's Policy Office, where we did some really cutting edge things that I'm still proud of to this day, many of which were rolled back by Governor Edward Edwards right away. Um, but they included things like linking the tax exemptions to the firm's environmental records. So if, for example, Formosa had outstanding fines, they couldn't get their big industrial tax exemption working to try to make sure that local communities were taking advantage of their siting authority so they wouldn't continue to site big plants because often we had to give out the permits if people met the targets for a particular chemical from a particular plant. Most importantly, worked with um, Kip Holden, who many of you know, he later became the um, mayor of Baton Rouge on an air toxics bill that reduced emissions by 50% in just four years that I'm very proud of. Um, but of course the work down there still continues and needs to happen. And like many people who started in air pollution, um, I shifted over to working on climate as I discovered more and more about the impacts of climate change that could really overtake a lot of the other work that we were doing. Um, so worked for 10 years at the Pew Center on Climate Change on federal policy. We all know how that ended up. And then for the last 12 years, I've been working more at the state and local level, but also to inform federal policymaking. And our work primarily is with a coalition of the willing states and local communities on both climate mitigation and adaptation. Um, on adaptation, our team just released an equitable adaptation toolkit that was informed by uh, folks on this call and otherwise um, to really look at adaptation with the lens of equity. So please check that out. Our work on mitigation was both around the Clean Power Plan and we did work with groups like um, We Act, Greens and EJ Forum on trying to incorporate equity considerations as much as possible in that policy as it was moving forward. Um, and with the states on the rollback of that sense. And we also facilitate the Transportation and Climate Initiative, which is having a very robust conversation that you're all very welcome to join on equity just this coming Tuesday and happy to talk more about that for anyone who's interested. Thank you for that. Uh, Anna? Hi, everyone. Um, I am Anna Baptista and I am um, I come to the to this work from uh, growing up in Newark and I worked for many years, almost a decade uh, in the local EJ organization called Ironbound Community Corporation. And I was actually there um, as the head of the EJ department when Hurricane Sandy hit um, and had a, a big wake up call about um, how, how climate change is gonna really exacerbate all of the disparities uh, communities of color and low wealth communities face. Um, and now I'm working at the 
Tishman Center um, for Environment and Design at the New School, and uh, I'm a professor of practice there. So a lot of my work right now is focused on working directly with um, EJ groups and coalitions um, on bringing more equity analysis to climate mitigation policies. Um, for example, looking more critically at um, market-based mechanisms and how they potentially impact um, EJ communities uh, negatively, and also issues around emissions reductions as part of any climate mitigation policies. Uh, we're currently doing some research in partnership with local EJ groups in New Jersey, Minnesota, and Delaware on emissions from the power sector and also looking at how the money that is promised to communities through renewable energy and energy efficiency programs, um, you know, how they're actually making it into communities and most of the money is not making it to those communities even when there are explicit mandates to do so. Um, so that's a lot of the research we're doing now and with the New Jersey EJ Alliance, uh, which I'm a, a, a trustee, a lot of the work we did after Hurricane Sandy was to try to bring more EJ communities into the conversation about um, the recovery process and um, dealing with the legacy of pollution that already exists in communities that a lot of people didn't want to talk about. They thought about the Jersey Shore, but they didn't think about over 4 million people that lived in the urban core that were port adjacent communities that had huge amounts of pollution really come into their neighborhoods um, and exacerbate their the disproportionate pollution in the, in the neighborhood. So a lot of the work we're continuing to do after Hurricane Sandy is convene communities that are often forgotten in the discussions around coastal communities or communities that are impacted by legacy pollution and how that's exacerbated with climate change. So I'll stop there. Thank you for that. Uh, and now Omar. All right, good afternoon. Um, uh, thank you, Shikobi, for the invitation to participate today on this panel. Uh, Omar Mohammed, um, I am the executive director for the Low Country Alliance for Model Communities in North Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and uh, LAMPSI uh, is an, a grassroots organization uh, that was started by the residents um, in the city of North Charleston that for generations uh, were disproportionately impacted by many uh, social determinants of health, uh, 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 industry, factories, just a lot of uh, environmental justice concerns. Um, and they wanted to organize to address those, those uh, concerns in, in, in a holistic way. Um, and what came out of that, or, you know, that, that organizing it, it is the uh, uh, LAMPSI organization. Uh, subsequent to our uh, uh, beginning stages, um, uh, we have been fortunate to use uh, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act uh, uh, to uh, mitigate some impacts uh, from some federal funded projects um, in our communities. And that is what allow us to be able to deploy those resources in our communities to, to uh, uh, have systemic impacts in our communities around affordable housing, economic development, education, and environmental justice. And we see all those areas um, as um, environmental justice concerns, as well as anything that impacts people's quality of life. We see, that we, we see those issues as um, environmental justice concerns. Thank you. So this, this next question, we want to go to Kareem first. Um, so, what? So, what are the associations between climate change and environmental justice, and how does climate change modify risk for communities impacted by environmental injustice? Well, I think right now we we're seeing climate change in so many different ways. Um, whether it's the wildfires out west, just kind of devastating California in, in those states, or um, even more recently with the extreme heat that we've been, we, we experienced this summer. Um, you know, even though it's cooling down, we know that the climate, um, it, it, the atmosphere, all of that is getting hotter. And so as it relates to environmental justice, communities of color, low income communities, et cetera, will be and have been consistently more impacted by climate change because of the systemic um, I think choices of our government of um, companies to make communities pretty much the dumping ground for industry um, to push us through redlining and a whole host of 
historic systemic decisions to put us, push us, you know, in the least desirable land that probably is more likely to be flooded, um, you know, not, ac not enough access to green spaces. Um, so many instances historically of um, Black communities um, that were once thriving that now have highways that have cut and crisscross through them, dividing them up, uh, you know, separating us from resources, et cetera. And all of those systemic decisions lead to um, the, the fact that, you know, we're typically on the wrong side of the track or in low country, et cetera. We're being exposed to so many different um, flooding issues, heat issues, et cetera. So with each, um, each year as we see more hurricanes, more extreme weather conditions, while everyone is feeling it, we know for sure that communities of color are most impacted. Even beyond the environmental harms that we're seeing, even the, um, just the government decision of where uh, funding should go after a hurricane or after some type of um, extreme weather condition is typically based on um, income. And so if you already have income disparities that exist in our communities, we're not going to see the same type of uh, support. Um, I, I believe it was last year, um, Dr. Bullard had said, you know, um, when we look at FEMA, you know, money follows power, follows race. And typically it, it goes in the direction of white people. So even when we're looking for equal and equitable treatment from the government in terms of relief from hurricanes, from all of these things, it typically is more um, uh, white homeowners who are getting more of those kinds of benefits, even though we're all paying our tax. So um, environmental justice, climate justice, all of those things are intertwined and are, um, and, and I think if we're really going to address climate change in this country, in the world, um, we have to put those communities that are most impacted first. And I think we're seeing that growing understanding of that, at least um, as a result of COVID-19, providing a really focused lens when you can look at the real stark disparities. I believe it's Blacks are dying two times the rate um, of white people. So seeing those really clear examples kind of says, you know, all the things we've been saying for decades. It's like, duh, that's why it's happening, exactly. pollution, you know? But um, so if we're talking about climate, if we don't have communities at the table and if we aren't letting them drive the discussion on what those solutions are, we're just going to continue to see the slow um, burn, <laughs> if you will, of indecision, I think, and also of policies don't, that don't really center us. No, thanks for that. What, what did Dr. Bullard say? Was it money follows, was it money follows money, money follows power, and money follows, money follows race. color? Yeah. Is, that, is that how you said it? Yeah, yeah. So that's a really powerful statement from him because you, you're talking about the embeddedness of race and racism. You're talking about, you know, as in your own comments, privilege, right? Mm -hmm. In many ways, you're talking about, you know, how the bitterness of white supremacy mm -hmm. <laughs> in yeah. our in our policies, right? And when and, and when it comes to climate change, that's really really dangerous, right? Uh, let me move to Anna. You you talked about Hurricane Sandy in your work with Ironbound. I'm gonna move to you next. You know this relationship between climate change and environmental justice. You, you, your communities have experienced it. Can you talk more about how that risk, what you saw the the, the climate, the risk that that been increased through the climate change in your communities? Yeah. Um... I think one of the most, you know, stark examples, you know, we can point to in, in Newark has been um, a lot of the Superfund sites. We have some of the highest density of Superfund sites in, in the country, in our area around Newark um, because of the industrial legacy. And um, during Hurricane Sandy, many of those sites get kicked up um, and they wash into people's homes and they expose people um, in ways that put them in further danger. Um, and you know, you, you know, decade a decade later, though, many of those same Superfund sites are still unaddressed. And actually, a lot of the rollbacks that have been happening at the federal level have put our communities further in danger um, because of the you know um, explicit you know ignore you know ignoring a lot of the the needs in terms of the um, Superfund sites and cleanups that are, are required. Um, another thing that happened after Hurricane Sandy is. Um, you know, climate gentrification. We saw a lot of the, the areas that were worst hit, um, areas that, um, where, you know, there was public housing um, or low income housing, um, you know, 
there was a, a push to, oh, you, you know, this is vulnerable, let's rezone you, let's rezone this whole area um, and basically just kick out um, uh, people of color and, and, and low wealth people and instead uh, put investment into, you know, ironically, oh, more housing, just this time the housing is going to be, you know, market rate and high rise and um, so you know people were finding themselves being pushed out of the communities um, after getting ex you know exposed and having been hit um, and being becoming climate refugees in a sense in their own communities um, and so a lot of effort went into post sandy um, into dealing with land use and how we you know this was always an issue it's always going to be an issue because of the history of redlining and how communities became um, so so deeply entrenched in, in these systems of segregating people but the the land use fights were really you know there's they continue today you know the fight to preserve public housing um, and invest in those places you know there's so many millions of dollars that went into making sure the millionaire's house on the waterfront got protected with beach replenishment. But when you're protecting 400 homes of affordable housing, all of a sudden it's, oh, it's not worth the investment. Let's, let's get rid of it. Um, and so that's been a real battle in communities to try to protect um, uh, communities from displacement, um, protect through land use planning and zoning um, to try to ensure up that communities aren't going to get further pushed out and are going to be protected also. Like what is the green infrastructure investments that we need to make to ensure that those communities aren't further harmed. Um, and it's been a real battle because I think the dollars, like you said, don't typically flow to those communities. And when they do flow, even when they do flow, um, a lot of the times the communities don't have a lot of say in how they're used. For example, sometimes um, the investments, quote unquote, that are made in the city of Newark uh, benefit developers and the kind of development that further spurs gentrification. So that's one of the things that I think um, we have to be careful of. No, uh, uh, just just to chime, you, you you hit on a couple of very important points. But you know, you think about environmental justice, and this and this is important for climate climate change. You know, how you build healthy community ecosystems. How we have to how can we move away from develop developer centric, the, the developer focused policies. Like we're talking about, this, so it's in, you know, we 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 really the system is it's been gamed or it's been set up for developers. I mean, just just something to think about. I mean, just not just for a question for you specifically. It's more rhetorical, but I think it's something that has to be in our mind. How can we move from a more com a developer centric system to more community focused system? So that's just that's something for us to think about, right? So Omar, you, you heard some of the stuff that Anna talked about. You know, your community has some some of the same types of industrial hazards down in. Um, in North Charleston. So can you talk about, you know, this intersection between climate change and environmental justice and how, you know, risk, you know, climate change is increasing a risk and potential negative impacts for your, for your communities uh, of land and, 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 and sea crab? Yeah. Uh, so definitely, I mean, we, we are along the coast. Uh, so uh, the, the climate um, uh, reality that, uh, I mean, we see that almost every day uh, when we have tidal flow. That, um, that, that make certain areas that were passable um, in the past are no longer passable due to just normal tidal flow. Um, um, and we just have extreme uh, sunny day flooding um, here. Excited. It makes it very, um, you know, it, 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 where streets are impassable. Um, uh, neighborhoods are flooded uh, that, that used to did not flood. Um, we have, uh, climate stress here, where uh, uh, residents who are um, uh, mostly elderly on fixed income, or uh, they are low wealth uh, uh, individuals or families, uh, they're spending excess of 30% of their income on just paying their rent or mortgage. And then on, a, on top of that, trying to, having the challenge of paying a high electrical bill uh, because of extreme uh, heat or extreme uh, cold events uh, that then add extra pressure to a family um, uh, when they have to make choices between putting food on the table, putting uh, medicine uh, for, for their child. Um, uh, so th that is adding also uh, psychological stress uh, to families uh, due to just, you know, weather, ext uh, weather extremes. We deal with a lot of homes um, in our communities that are not uh, uh, weatherized. Uh, so they, uh, uh, these homes tend to leak. Uh, and when I say leak, they, the inside 
uh, atmosphere leaks, right? Uh, so they, it's hard for them to cool their homes. It's hard for them to heat their homes. Uh, so we, we see climate uh, uh, justice and community resiliency also um, as um, on occupied rehab programs in our community to bring the standards of these homes up uh, so that uh, uh, the envelope that makes up the home is also uh, 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 protects the family that's inside. Um, if, if you're talking about an elderly individual that is in a stream heat uh, uh, circumstance and, and they cannot afford uh, to cut on their air conditioning, they're, the inside of their house is, more, is hotter than outside. So a lot of times that causes a lot of health uh, concerns when it comes to asthma, other types of respiratory diseases, or um, other type of health, you know, health uh, 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 stressors that is added on by these by these um, heat events. Air quality is impacted by by climate. So our communities are already, you know, over polluted uh, uh, from other industries. Add on the uh, heat island effect to that, and and you just got you 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 create a situation that our communities are just overburdened. Um, and then when it comes to just flooding from uh, uh, hurricanes or those types of uh, events in, in the Charleston area, there is always the threat of um, uh, contaminants from nearby Superfund sites, brownfields, flooding into the community and uh, uh, potentially contaminating uh, uh, neighborhood uh, urban farms, uh, neighborhood gardens, uh, contaminating those with heavy metals and other pollutions that are coming off those sites. Uh, so, so it, 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 it's, it's a challenge um, and how we go about um, addressing those, th those concerns in our communities is uh, uh, definitely something that we, uh, as an organization, that uh, we are taking some, some, some beginning to start to look at that uh, through a, a resiliency lens and how, how the community can play a, a more of a participatory role in, in what those solutions look like at their community. Thank you, Omar. Uh, let's move to Vicki next. Sure. Um, on, on that topic, Sakobi? Um, yes. Okay. So, you know, as, as I mentioned, I'm from New Orleans, so I often think of this through the lens of, you know, what we saw there in Katrina. Um, and um, you know, obviously, we see the racial disparity that the world saw, and um, you know that that I think people still have in their mind is those horrible images of people, you know, trying to fight for their lives if they had, <laughs> if they were still living, you know, on their roofs or in places like the Superdome or where they went for shelter and safety at the convention center, but there was like no water, anything to be found. Um, my own family's experience was that the year before Katrina, when Ivan, we thought was going to be the big one, and my parents evacuated. My father, Sidney Arroyo, actually died in that evacuation um, with heart failure. And so part of why I tell that story is because I think a lot of people question, like, why do people stay behind the following year when Katrina was so threatening? And, you know, evacuations themselves can be incredibly stressful. The contra flow the year before was really poor. That allows people, you know, to, to use the lanes that are usually coming in the city to go out. And, and, and so I think people saw that experience and made judgment calls. You know, some of it, of course, was about resources. Did they have transportation? Did they have money at the end of the month to pay for shelter? Did they have young ones and elderly people that they were taking care of that they were also, you know, responsible for and couldn't get from point A to point B? Many of the people who moved out of New Orleans and never moved back um, in Katrina were female head of households that we know are often, um, you know, uh, paid less dollar for dollar for their work than men, especially black women, you know, who headed some of those households who've never really been able to make it back to New Orleans. My family lost their homes in Katrina the next year. And for the most part, eventually after living with me or other relatives for some time, made their way back. But, you know, having that experience and watching them and the pain associated with losing your home and wondering if your whole culture and community was coming back, you know, was really something that affected me, even though I work on these issues, and makes me really try when we do work on adaptation and resilience to really focus not so much on just the infrastructure, which of course has to be changed with climate change in mind, with rising seas and more intense storms and heat and all of the above, but really to focus more on the people. Um, 
you know, people like Omar was just describing, who, you know, might survive the storm, but if they lose their power, like Lake Charles just did, for weeks at a time, or potable water, people die from that. Uh, my sister Maria has MS and has had to recently evacuate in Louisiana when she was visiting my family down there from storms, and then more recently in Ramona, California from fires and bad air quality. And the scariest thing of all is if they lose power and heat um, can affect somebody with MS very dramatically and her wheelchair won't work. So, you know, I mean, all of these cascading disasters are affecting people, but the people who tend to be vulnerable because of the situation that society places them in, whether it's due to redlining or lack of economic opportunity, or people who are disabled or elderly who died in the highest numbers in Louisiana and New Orleans um, from Katrina, you know, those are the people that we really have to put first in our planning. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing about your father. I'm sorry to hear about your father. And I didn't know that. Uh, and what you're sharing speaks to the fact that you, you made a very important point about, about the evacuation. So we have the preparedness, right? And we have people evacuating. We have to make sure we're protecting the most vulnerable during evacuations. So whether it be folks who are elderly people, like you said, your sister, who may have some uh, disability, you mean children who in many cases cannot protect themselves at all. So that they're very at high injury risk, um, uh, you know, drowning risk or, or any climate change related part of heat waves, right? Children, right? Elderly, flooding, children. Who should we be always thinking about during these, these impacts? Fires. Y'all saw the devastation last year from the fires. It's been heartbreaking again to see more and people who lost their loved ones uh, because they couldn't get out, or you know there wasn't enough notice, or just the, so many fires. So where do you go? That to me is a, I mean, it's something that we have to figure out how to really, during this time of climate change, help people uh, reduce their risk of morbidity and losing their lives during the forest fire. So thank you for sharing that insight. I wanna, I wanna move to Dr. Hendricks, but. Uh, uh, you you talked about New Orleans, and the next question was was going to be uh, on New Orleans. But I want to I want to talk. We, so, Dr. Hendricks, when you talk uh, when you answer this question, we can go ahead and transition to this hurricane discussion, which I want to get to this 15th anniversary of of, of Hurricane Katrina, and also with, with Vicky, your comment makes a remind, and also with Kareen's comment, reminder about the 25th anniversary of the Chicago heat wave, right? That's that that's this year as well, and also other heat waves. But but Marcus, to you. Can you talk, answer that question, but answer in the context of hurricanes, because we want to talk more about hurricanes in the context of uh, Hurricane Harvey, environmental justice, climate change, hurricanes. And sure, sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> first, let me say that, you know, I'm just really enjoying just listening to everybody else on this panel. I think, you know, everything that I normally would have said and, and attempted to emphasize has already been said so well. Um, but I did want to pick up on, on something that, you know, uh, Vicky said in terms of, you know, people, right? Um, and, and I think, you know, I want to take what you said, Shikopi, a, a bit further in terms of th this larger existential question of how do we move from being developer-centric, but how do we move from being structure-centric, right, to, to thinking about the people that actually live there? And, and I okay. think that that ought to be at the core of what we do, and particularly in terms of hazards, emergency management, disaster planning, you know, even in the news, we, we talk more about structures and damage related to structures as opposed to the people themselves. Um, and I think something, a running theme that I've gathered thus far across the speakers is that, you know, um, this is fundamentally, you know, not, not just sort of a, an environmental justice and, and a climate justice issue, but this is a social justice and civil rights issue. And I think what we're embarking upon is really sort of a, a long time catastrophe in the making that started as far back as, you know, uh, reconstruction um, and everything that ensued thereafter from redlining and racial zoning to chronic unemployment you know, substandard housing, segregation, ongoing economic, you know, disinvestment, poverty rates. These are very much so social issues and civil rights issues at the core. Um, and I always like to say that when we think about the quality 
of the the broader built environment or the broader environment in general. And this is why I appreciate you know Omar's works so much is because the quality of the broader environment is usually sort of a reflection of the quality of housing, right? And the quality of housing is usually a reflection of the people that live there, right? And we know that, you know, um, it, it tends to be lower income and people of color that occupy substandard housing that, that then affects the, the, the community tax base and the ability to, to install and main, uh, maintain infrastructure um, and or to push back against industry in terms of the siting of some of the more classic um, and traditional environmental justice issues. And so, you know, I think when it comes to the Chicago heat wave or, or Harvey or, you know, or, or, you know um, Katrina, these were sort of smaller disasters building up to sort of what we're on the verge of seeing if in fact we don't sort of make some some really significant changes in a truncated amount of time. You know, I was uh, I was on a, a, a panel yesterday with the executive director um, of the United Nations uh, program on the environment, um, and, and she made a, a comment about how essentially between 2020 and 2030, we have to see. Um, on average, every year, a 7.6% reduction in, in CO2 in order to, to not reach 1.5 degrees Celsius. And, and, you know, at the height of quarantine and the shutdown, we only minimized our carbon um, emissions to 7%. At the height of, of quarantine and shutdown, we were only at 7%. And so if we think about things are starting to reopen and business getting back to usual, we don't stand a chance in terms of missing that 1.5 degrees Celsius mark. And so we're going to see Katrina on steroids and, and, and Harvey on steroids sooner than later. Um, and I think, again, you know, with us not addressing these fundamental civil rights and social justice issues, um, it's going to be the same folks who, who bear the brunt of, you know, exposure and impact as well as, um, you know, differential outcomes in terms of, of ongoing and long-term uh, recovery. Uh, and it's critical because, you know, looking backwards and looking forward, we know that the majority of Black folks following Reconstruction still live in the Southeastern portion of the United States. And even within the Southeastern portion of the United States, we know within communities, they typically live on the lowest lying of lands and the most marginalized lands, right? And so, you know, floodplains and, and the places that typically have flooded with more regular storm events from a 1% flood to a 5% flood, these more extreme events that we're seeing, you know, they don't stand a chance in terms of, of not being impacted or being able to effectively respond. And so I think as we look forward, you know, if we're not focusing on these historical, you know, legacies that have plagued particularly lower income and, and Black communities, then we're, we're missing a mark. And, and I was also talking to some engineers and telling them that if we think about adaptations and infrastructure, if we're not thinking about the people, if we're not centering these things with the people, then we're just thinking about adaptations for the sake of adaptations or we're just thinking about adaptations for a particular group that has always benefited and had the opportunity to take advantage of sort of these emerging opportunities and technologies. And so I think, you know, again, just reflecting on these catastrophic events that will only get much more intense and worse, we have to think about the people, we have to think about the circumstances that they have endured over the years, um, and, and, and allow those experiences and things to guide what we do differently on the other side of this. So thank you for that, um, Marcus. I want to, I was going to say we're going we're gonna to shift the hurricanes. I want to, I know we're, we have about 40, 40 minutes left, well, less than 40 minutes left. And this is really great, you know, insight that y'all provided, but we're not going to get to all those questions. I'm going to kind of restructure the questions a little bit. So I want to get to this resiliency question first. So we want to make sure we spend time on that. Um, and, and, and this will connect to some of the points that y'all have already made. So this session, we talk about beyond resilience. We talk a lot about resilience. And, and I want y'all to think about 
in your answers, uh, and I want to start with um, maybe start with Vicky. Uh, uh, Vicky first. What does resilience really mean, right? Because I was at a, a NEJAC meeting uh, recently, and a professor from uh, one of the universities in Puerto Rico, maybe Mieue, or I forget, maybe it's a, uh, maybe San Juan. He said, "I'm I'm tired of us talking about." He's talking about Hurricane Maria. I can't. I don't. I'm gonna paraphrase. I can't quote him directly. But he said, "You know, I'm tired of about talking about resilience. We're, we're experiencing toxic resilience. That's the term he used." We're experiencing talks. We get getting hit by hurricanes. We got no support from the U.S. You know, people are dying. They have these super fun sites. People are, are struggling. Sitting at me a year without power. You know, he was saying that you know resilience doesn't make sense for folks who are frontline, fence line, e EJ communities. So I want y'all to think about what do you I mean? How you define resilience, and then how can we move beyond resilience? How does that look? Because in some ways, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of riffing on resilience. We think about revitalization. We used to talk revitalization. We got revitalized. I don't want to get back to where I was. Mm -hmm. I want to get to where I'm supposed to be. So that's the thing. That, so that's the same with this whole thing about resilience, right? Not where, where because the we, we have we, uh, COVID-19, right? Look, look at, we talked about at the symposium. Who's most impacted by COVID? COVID's made visible. The populations are possibly made invisible. Elderly folks, children, people with you know low wealth folks, right? People who are on the meat meatpacking, et cetera, et cetera. Agricultural workers, folks on the coastline, folks on the fence line. So, what does resilience mean to them? Right. So that's I just want so I just want y'all to think about that. And so, go to you first, Vicky. What does it mean? But how can we move beyond it? I'm I'm so enjoying listening you, to you. <laughs> I, I, I hate to I hate to interrupt because like I I could listen to that. No, all go ahead. Go ahead. Um, go ahead. I mean. So, so earlier today, um, I, I heard uh, that song, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger. And I was thinking about that in the context of this conversation. And the fact that, you know, that might be true if you've got time to like recover. But when you don't, you know, before you're knocked down again, whether it be by, you know, the brutality kind of incidents that we're seeing in our society or, you know, these storms that are now coming in two by two to you know, states like Louisiana, I mean, crazy stuff, you know, these really dramatic fires and the air quality issues that go along with them where people literally can't breathe and then they're told to close their windows and they might not have air conditioning and that's dangerous. Um, and I remember something that um, a psychologist, I, have, I don't have a background in that, um, but, but I heard one say years ago, which is, you know, it's really hard to even bounce back to where you were um, much less get to a healthier state when you've been knocked down and before you make it your way up to where you were before, you get knocked down again and again, you know? And so, um, you know, obviously that's so true of systemic racism and all the other assaults that people are feeling right now in our political life. Um, but I've also learned from Dr. Robin Fivish, who um, writes about resilience on a personal level at Emory where I went um, as an undergraduate, that part of how people survive all the knocks in life is by sharing their stories, right? And one of the things that she found is that in her research, you know, I'm really related to climate or uh, is the issues that we work on per se, is that people um, are more resilient when they spend time together as families, like around a dinner, dinner table. And it's not so much the act of eating or you know the healthy foods and all, all, all that I'm sure is important, but it's it's that often you know in the before times that's where we share what happened in our day, right? What happened good in our day? What happened bad in our day? You know what's upsetting? And then young people get to see sort of how adults model their reaction to those bad or good things that happen, right? And and it's also where we often tell stories of family members who went before us who encountered challenges, you know, everything from, you know, racism over the generations in our society to my own family's experience with hurricanes, going back to Hurricane Betsy, where my grandparents lost their home, which really came back to me when I had devastation in my own little Arlington house from Isabel, and then, of course, my own family living with me after Katrina. And so, you know, connecting the dots, I think one of the things that actually does help people be more resilient is like these kind of connections, right? I mean, family connections that go back over the years 
and, and not just sharing the good times, but sharing the bad times and how people got through that. I think that's really important. It's something that I try to talk to my students about. It's why I try to bring in some of these personal stories, even in professional settings, um, because I think storytelling on climate change to really capture people both on doing more to mitigate climate change, but also to prepare, you know, really can make a difference and, and really help both the storyteller and everyone, you know. Um, I mean, it's not a panacea, but in a small way, I think that that can help us all be more resilient. No, thank you for that. Uh, Omar, I want to I wanna come to you next. What does resilience mean to you in, in, in this context of climate change? No, you know, I have, we, have, we talked about heat islands and heat waves and forest yeah and flooding and hurricanes, you know, we have other climate related perturbations. What does resilience mean to, mean to you? And, and how are you doing work of this own resilience? But how can we move? How do you think we can move beyond resilience? Yeah, so um, uh, for us, uh, resiliency uh, looks like community based solutions um, uh, that is driven by the community that is impacted the most by you know, these impacts. Um, it, 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 it blows my mind a lot uh, when groups, nonprofits, other groups come in and have discussions about climate change, but those very people who are impacted by it every day is absent from that conversation. Uh, so we are working uh, locally, right, to change that, that conversation, change that dynamic through a lens of environmental justice. So we created a coalition uh, called the Charleston Climate Coalition that focused on working with disproportionate impacted communities, mostly black and brown communities in the Charleston area, uh, working with them to uh, uh, identify and characterize those things that is most important to them, right? And it may not be climate or it may not be a flood. Flooding is definitely one, but it may be, you know, something else. But what we do is that the, the, the people who understand what climate change is and know what that language is, right? We not only, we, 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 we help them to frame their concerns at the local level in, uh, uh, through a lens of, of climate change. So when we go to the city, when we go to the federal government, when we go to whomever we is, uh, you know, that we are working with to bring solutions into the community, we, we, we frame, a you know, uh, 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 those concerns through a lens of, of climate reality and climate change. The second thing that we do is that um, in, in addition to that, right, in, in addition to that, we um, uh, help the community develop community-based mutual networks where they depend on their community resource, not necessarily the government. When an emergency happens, you know, our government has let us down, you know, many times. So how, how can the community build up networks in which it can, it, it can uh, fall back on and rely on. And then thirdly, uh, what we do is that we are starting now with this uh, uh, community-based urban design center where we help communities look at their environment and what can be done in those communities to improve their environment. Through uh, when, when the city uh, uh, pr uh, promotes a plan, uh, do, is that something the community supports or do the community want to come up with a plan that, that opposes that? Uh, so helping the community to frame, you know, those, those uh, concerns and ideas, uh, 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 you know, differently and, and be able to promote their needs, uh, uh, you know, broadly didn't just uh, uh, at the community level. Thank you for that. Let's go to um, Marcus next. So how we can move, what does it mean and how can we move beyond it? And, and particularly in the work that you're doing, that you've done in Houston, the work you're doing in Maryland. Yeah, yeah. You know, to, to, to be quite honest, you know, more recently, I've been more and more conflicted by the idea of resilience. And I think, you know, Vicky started to touch on it a, a little bit, you know, but, you know, <laughs> being made to be or forced into resiliency is a hell of a burden right um especially in the context of, of white supremacy and, and disproportionate impacts right because a lot of white communities don't have to be resilient because they never missed a beat or missed a step right they weren't exposed or impacted negatively to begin with right and so i think you know 
the the more I've sat with this, you know, especially a, as a more traditional disaster scholar, I've recognized and realized that to me, resiliency almost is synonymous with burdensome in, in many ways because getting kicked down and having to get back up time and time again, especially when just by the nature of identity for other folks, you know, they get the resources that they need or, or they, you know, miss the whole event or negative impacts to begin with just by their whiteness, you know, that that's that's something crazy to, to, to sit with, right? Um, and so, you know, as much as I, you know, appreciate, you know, what Omar just said, because a lot of my work is centered around how can we engage, how, how can we meaningfully engage communities um, around sort of, the use of community science to inform designs and plans and be involved in and monitoring to then oversee and provision infrastructure and a number of other environmental assets and features toward resilience. But then again, going back to sort of white supremacy and whiteness, white communities don't have to do anything to just, to, and, and to be fine and to be good, right? So we have the, the, this burden of uh, disproportionate exposure and impact, classic traditional EJ issues. But then we have this burden of proof of having to sort of empirically demonstrate and show that in fact, you know, these communities are being affected in the ways that, that they know, right? But then we also have this burden of participation and having to sort of work two jobs, then just to come home and participate in some you know, extracurricular activity with universities or other advocacy groups around issues that shouldn't be an issue to begin with. And then this issue, this burden of resilience. So a suite of burdens between, you know, exposure, proof, you know, participation and resilience. Meanwhile, you know, white folks in general are, are just going on about their everyday lives accruing wealth and opportunities and, and have the sort of physical and, and imaginary freedom to, to to really move beyond resilience right and so i think honestly that's that's kind of you know i i hate to be a, a cynic in a moment but that's kind of like where i am um, right now in terms of just really sort of seeing the burden in being resilient no, no, no. That's why I said beyond resilience. That's why I highlighted Professor from Puerto Rico. Like, We're tired of being resilient. And I'm going to shout out for Nice real quick. Is it resilience of repeated assaults? <laughs> right? So, so I said it, there's two different systems. So you, because your skin color, you don't have the complexion for protection, you have to be resilient. Right, right. I'm a, I've, I've gained benefits. You said imaginary, some you know, not earned. What I have to worry about right. fairness to worry about the response right not to worry about recovery that means we have two different systems against the language about we have two different americas right right so it speaks to how can we this gets back to the issue of systemic racism social justice and equity mm -hmm. but at the heart of what we're talking about in this discussion we have to have equity 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 right. so getting back to uh, kareen's point i'm gonna come to kareen about the, the conversation we have about dr bullet real quick what do you say uh what do we say, Kareem? Uh, money follows money. Money follows power. Money follows color. That's, that's what Dr. Bullard said, right? Yeah. That's kind of what you're, you're, you're speaking to. So go ahead. What it means, I mean, we're talking, really important comments from Marx about we, resilience is old in some ways. It gets us stuck in a mindset that we have to be this way. Why can't we build a different system? Well, we don't have to be resilient, right? As Marx said, go ahead. Me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, there was a NPR um, story that followed a white family after Hurricane Harvey and then a black um, male woman who had a family. And the, just the slowness um, of relief that came to 
the black woman and then the you know the immediacy in terms of insurance protection and all these other things that the white family experienced and they were able to be made whole relatively quickly and i think that we know that to be the real experience for folks so when we think about resiliency you know it's you know the ability to bounce back after you know some type of issue and when we talk about climate after some type of climate um whether it's a hurricane or whatever just the ability to um, find a way to rebuild your life back but we know for a fact that a lot of people haven't there are people who were impacted by katrina who have who will never return back to new orleans who live in houston or other parts of the country and you know there's even there's no way to really even quantify the number of people who have been pushed out of new orleans and have don't have the ability to come back because they can't afford it and then to see frankly the growth of gentrification that has been as a result and a lot of the people who now move in because they have more income can have um, and build their homes to be more resilient in the case of you know more hurricanes so when we think of um, just the realities for our communities even with hurricane sandy there are people still in far rockaway queens who have not bounced back from hurricane sandy so um i think when we talk about resilience the reality is it's access to resources and one's ability to get the support they need as quickly as possible to either move away to to evacuate if they need to um and then to come back and restore their homes and, and get those types of coverage and i know um in the um house um the um, the special committee on the climate crisis. There's a, a long section on resiliency and adaptability, and there's a number of um, legislation in place to that has been introduced. But until we get the Senate to match up, where is it to go, right? And I believe Maxine Waters has introduced a lot of legislation around um, legislation around um, flood insurance and um, even making it more equitable for people of color to get it. I believe typically when you get a home insurance, you have to pay it up front. And so if you don't have that upfront money, you know, what does that do for your home when a hurricane comes and you don't have adequate coverage? So I know one provision in some of the legislation she was introducing was about making, um, you know, smaller down payments available to homeowners. So, so those kinds of things. But I think we're all saying the same things. And the reality is we're going to see more extreme conditions. And we, we know for a fact that the people who will be most most impacted and won't have the, the access to those resources will be people of color. So I don't want to keep saying that, but it, it, that's just the reality. So we, we try to be resilient. We try to prepare. But if you don't have, um, you know, some liquid assets or some money right away to come to help, the government likely isn't going to really be as responsive either. Thank you for that. Um, let's, Anna, can you, can you answer that question? Yeah, everybody did such a beautiful job already. I, I, I think the only thing I'll add is that when we um, talk to, you know, local community members after, you know, after Sandy and, and um, you know, people didn't talk about resilience, you know, what they talked about was being in communities where they had, you know, access to dignified homes, you know, clean, livable jobs. Um, free of police violence, you know, healthy air to breathe. They, they talked about, you know, justice. They talked about climate justice. And so, um, you know, a lot of what people want is not just to go back to the same conditions. They want, you know, to be able to, you know, joyfully and fully, you know, be in their communities um, and not constantly be under threat from a multitude of places. Um, and so to, to me, I'll just, I think what we heard from communities, you know, in New Jersey is we, we heard we want reparations, we want climate reparations, we want climate restoration, we want restorative justice. Um, you know, we want the kinds of communities that are free from all different kinds of assaults. Um, and how do we build that, those systems? And, and unfortunately, what the community learned after Sandy and after many different types of shocks is that the government is not necessarily <laughs> or not usually going to be um, the key driving force in any kind of really restorative or reparative uh, process. And that has to be led by the residents themselves um, demanding and organizing and ensuring that that is moving forward. Otherwise, I think a lot of what um, gets talked about as climate mitigation and resiliency and adaptation is like the crumbs off the table. It's like the trickle down of whatever is, you know, um, 
you know, that little equity add on that communities often get um, stuck with. So I think to have really justice centered um, climate responses, those things have to be led by the people that are most impacted. And that's where we're gonna find real climate justice. Well, thank you for that. And I wanna, I wanna uh, uh, shout out to Bernice and others in the chat, uh, highlight, you know, these issues are just not impacting black, indigenous people, color communities, it's also impacting uh, poor white communities. So they mentioned, you know, folks in Appalachia, folks in Kentucky. So we wanna make sure that, you know, hurricanes, you know, these, these uh, climate events don't discriminate, right? So they impact all of us, but they impact some of us disproportionately. And in a lot of cases, the disproportion, the connection is really around poverty. So we're talking about structural racism in this country. We're also talking about structural poverty. So to make people more resilient or go beyond resilience, we have to address both structural racism and also address structural poverty. And you know, you think about the EJ movement, because uh, I think it's a comment about the Poor People's Campaign. Let's just go back to the history of the EJ movement with the, with the real father. Let me stop being bad. With the father of the EJ movement, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr was his assassination with the, the Memphis sanitation worker strike, right? Labor issues, right? The poor people's, camp, poor people's campaign. That's where you think about the work around poverty and what it means. So you hear, you hear all of, a lot of us are talking about this discussion about investing. One of the ways to address climate injustice, environmental injustice is, is to invest in communities. So I think that's a powerful message that we're getting from the chat. Appreciate y'all highlighting those, those items. Uh, what I want to do now, I want to save some time. I have a few, a few minutes for questions. To get I, just, I just wanted to say really quick that yeah, go ahead. it's W.B. Du Bois who should be crowned as a father. So he's the grand, no, no, no. He's the <laughs> grandfather of the EJ movement. Philadelphia Negro, thank you for reminding me. Thank you. Grandfather and then the father of the EJ movement is Dr. King. And the mother of the EJ movement, Vernice knows who the mother is. Well, Vernice, I'm not saying you're the mother, but you know what I'm saying. Our, you know, friends from Chicago, right? And so we want to give shout outs to those folks. But it, it, the, the connection between all those folks and, this, and, this chat, and in the chat, we got to talk about poverty, too. We got to talk about poor people. So I just want to make sure, I, just wanna, I want to highlight that. So thanks, thanks for y'all, you know, making sure that, that, that we, we, we made that point. Um, so, and, and, and undocumented? And people experiencing homelessness too, especially when it comes to heat waves and the air pollution issues that we just saw out west, and the fires and the people who are picking grapes when the fires are right there on the ridge. So getting on. No, no, that. Uh, uh, thank you for that. So when you think about these these disasters, so we're talking about disasters, y'all. I'm, I'm gonna close this out. I'm gonna give y'all time to do you know lightning summary. Think about disasters, whether it be a biological disaster, a natural disaster, or an unnatural disaster, technological disaster. It's the same folks hit. Uh, first and worst. We're talking about poor folks. We're talking about people of color. We're talking about folks who own, who own the margins. We're talking about homeless folks. We're talking about people who are essential workers, right? Are agricultural workers, people working at meat packing plants. It's this, regardless of the disaster, susceptible population, we're talking about children and elderly. So, so again, this discussion, think about all those groups, right? How can we move people who may have disabilities? How can we move beyond resilience for those populations as pertains to climate justice and environmental justice, okay? So like, like Vincent said, hit first, hit worst, and hit the most. How can we move beyond resilience for those populations? So to close up before we get to Q&A, I wanna get each of you, you know, just like real quick, what, what are the next steps when it comes to climate justice? What is the next steps? I know Marcus said, let's stop talking about resilience. Well, give me a new word, Marcus, when it's your turn. Well, if it's not resilience, is it, is it resistance and resilience? Give me something, brother man. I'm sorry, I'm getting too excited. L give me something. So, so what is it? So I'm, uh, since I said, I called you out, Marcus, I'm gonna get, get you the first round, go first to close us out. Wh what do we go next, Marcus? Uh, I think it's still to be determined. I mean, I, I think, and really I wanna sort of, you know, I would honestly, would like the communities to sort of provide whatever sort of next phase that we enter and whatever, you know, term we coin to really sort of pronounce that. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll leave, you know, everyone with, you know, this idea of, uh, 
you know, obviously when we talk about social vulnerability to disaster, we're talking about the ways in which several groups, um, you know, disabled groups, you know, communities of color, low income, you know, women are disproportionately impacted. But I think, you know, this idea of, uh, of intersectionality and, and if we can, if we can think about this, if we can position the poor single mother of color to move beyond resilience, then we simultaneously take care of absolutely everybody else, right? And so I think that's the perspective that I'm coming from, not to sort of, you know, leave out sort of poor folks, you know, or, you know, poor working class white folks, because we know from, from Kentucky to Louisiana, you know, these groups are uh, being impacted and affected. But then also being from Texas and doing work in emergency management and disaster, we also know when you control for the poor factor, so you got a, a poor black woman and a poor white woman going to receive or apply for assistance in the aftermath of disaster, there's some discrimination that happens even within those types of processes, right? And so again, I think, you know, if we if we take care of the most marginalized and not to, you know, get into sort of the, the disadvantaged gymnastics, but again, I think, you know, if we take care of the, the folks who have been catching the most hell um, over these years, then everybody else that's sort of above that or has a little bit more privilege will be taken care of. And I think that's where we ought to be sort of shooting for in terms of moving beyond resilience and supporting these particularly marginalized communities. Thank you, Marcus. Let's go to Anna. I mean, I, I would um, just mention some of the things that um, um, residents are doing in Newark and Camden and in and, and Trenton, other parts of New Jersey, even and, and Brooklyn, some of the groups I'm working with there. A lot of the work they're doing right now is around um, community ownership you know, taking back ownership of land, um, whether it's through cooperative farming, community land trust, cooperative housing, community owned solar, um, trying to really build a base of, of wealth and also of control, community control over these systems. Um, unfortunately, we have these energy systems. Um, a lot of the, the climate solutions are very top down. And I think communities are trying to take back control of some of those systems, whether it's the, through the energy sector or housing. Um, there's a really great um, effort right now with Ironbound Community Corporation where residents um, are being trained and they're forming a cooperative for green infrastructure development and they're trying to take pieces of land not only uh, to reclaim them for green infrastructure but also to build housing urban gardens zero waste um, composting plots and it's a way to um, also capture some of the money tremendous amounts of money that are going into some of the infrastructure projects that are being mandated by the state um, and usually that just gets gobbled up by companies that come from out of out of the the community um, and instead, you know, trying to build that wealth in the, in the neighborhood when those investment co investments come. So those are some of the community centered solutions that I think are the future and that really project into the world, like the climate justice we want to see in the world. Well, you got me excited. You started talking about building ecotopias. I mean, that's the whole, that's, that's the conversation we're going to be having. Or I'll be honest, I'm talking about Afrotopias and making Wakanda real. That's a whole different level of conversation though. Go ahead, brother Omar. I know you got some things to follow up what Anna just said. No, I mean, basically, I mean, I ditto exactly what Anna and um, uh, Marcus have stated. Um, uh, just to add uh, to their comments, um, uh, I know here locally, we're having discussions, uh, not only with the, with the community, but with government about uh, local solutions to work with our natural environment instead of working against it. Charleston for, for, for hundreds of years have worked against nature. Uh, they filled in a, you know, a, a, a estuary that has become the, the peninsula of Charleston. And that water is, I mean, it, it's gonna naturally flow where it has always flowed. Um, and now we are, we, we are living um, uh, through the, the, you know, the poor decisions that we made uh, to build on low lying areas. So we're looking at uh, uh, local solutions about how 
what can be done through green infrastructure and other type of policies and other type of solutions to slow, store, and release water uh, um, and work with the um, environment instead of working against it. Thank you. Let's move to uh, Vicki. So yeah, I loved all the comments so far and just keying off Omar's remarks. Um, I want to give a shout out to Bernice because I see her on the call. Um, Bernice has helped us facilitate um, at Georgetown and in the District of Columbia conversations with community about what it is that they want to make their communities more resilient, both in Ward 7, um, for those of you who aren't, who aren't local on the other side of the Anacostia River um, from downtown DC around, you know, what their priorities are. And, and often it's not what we assume they might be or should be when it comes to climate changes, but it's also about like workforce development and training of young people and training, training for people coming out of prison um, so that they can have jobs. Um, I do want to give a shout out to the fact that Governor Newsom in California now allowed the people who are on the front lines fighting fires right now, putting their lives at risk to actually be able to do that for a livelihood when they get out, which is, you know, the basic human decent thing to do. Um, Bernice continues that great work with us and APHA, um, Public Health Association and the district government on heat right now in this COVID moment. It's so important because so many people have not been able to use the formal and informal mechanisms to stay cool, like, you know, splash parks, swimming pools, cooling centers, going to the mall, going to a movie to get out of your hot apartment. That's just not you know, easily out there. So we're connecting service providers and also residents and hearing from them about what their needs are and what their priorities are. And what we're finding in that process is that there's a lot of interest. I saw the chat, you know, somebody was asking about um, suburbia, either suburbia or in urban settings. People care about protecting mature trees for all kinds of reasons, for, for forest, for canopy, for cooling, for absorbing water, for habitat that connects us to nature in a way that helps us mentally physical, you know, exercise, you know, by having trees and parks and all that good stuff. Um, but of course, there are always concerns about gentrification when communities are talking about investing in these kind of amenities. So I'm glad that, um, that Anna gave a shout out to Community Land Trust. It's something that our Climate Center at Georgetown Law has looked into. How do you protect the people who made these communities places that people want to live? whether it's Little Haiti or New Orleans post-Katrina, like Corrine said, and make sure that people who made them those communities that are so attractive to other people can still afford to live in them. And it really requires a lot of us to stretch and to go into different disciplines that we really didn't study in school, like housing policy, for example. Good. Thank you for that. And close, Corrine, close us out real quick. Emphasis on quick. Okay, well, I'll give one real good example. Um, in after Hurricane Sandy, uh, we acted a number of other uh, community stakeholders came together to have like seven meetings. Oh, and with over 400 people just talking about how resiliency should, um, what it should look like in New York. And out of that came our North Manhattan Climate Action Plan. And some of the um, recommendations that a number of people had included community land trust, water conservation systems, um, more solar uh, um, microgrid kind of opportunities for communities. And our own Solar Uptown Now program came out of that. And that program where we've trained um, folks in Harlem to be Become solar installers. 900 residents have benefited it from um, with it at I believe 11 public um, uh, public um, housing buildings and also just um, affordable housing buildings now have solar panels on their roof, etc. So like real concrete things that we could do and the savings that they experienced through those solar panels could then offset any kind of um, upgrades to the buildings. And we know so many of our public housing buildings um, need to be upgraded. And if they aren't, how are they going to even respond to everyday needs? Much much less a, you know, a hurricane or anything else. So I think community driven solutions, um, we all understand that to be a really great place to start. And I think we, we know this, and, but I don't think the larger public understands that typically the people living in communities know exactly what they need, exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. And if you put the time up front um, to really work with them, and it, sometimes it's a slow churning process, but the benefits um, to having the access to their information, to their expertise, puts, I think, cities and other municipalities um, at the benefit of really driving solutions that they really need. So um, I think, again, the, the theme has consistently been that community engagement to ask people how would they prefer to see their lives moving forward. Well, thank you. Very powerful statements, very 
powerful suggestions and solutions that people, and I really love community owned and managed, community driven, community informed. We're talking about community. So thank you for that. Uh, let's thank our panelists and the way we can via Zoom. I want to take a couple quick questions or comments. I'm going to go to Joe James first. Joe, if you want to get on the mic, you got a minute to uh, just, just to provide a little quick, some quick comments. Thank you, Sokobi. Uh, I've enjoyed hearing the comments this afternoon. I'm a black entrepreneur, former economic development professional. I developed a technology in South Carolina focused on rural communities and job creation using biomass and bio crops. My company, my Maryland company has been very fortunate to have been selected by the Exelon Foundation's Climate Change Initiative to do a project in Baltimore. And I wanted to make sure that Anna, Kareen, and Omar know of our interest in collaborating uh, with communities in other parts of the, of, the, of the country. We grow very special bio crops. They absorb four time, almost four times as much CO2 as trees would. Uh, they also remediate brownfield sites. They also can, uh, and this is very important with COVID-19, they can screen out uh, airborne particulate matter. We then harvest those crops and we convert them into a variety of bio products uh, that are good for the environment, but also we're creating jobs in a very community in which we're trying to, to solve problems. Uh, I, I provided a, a little note in the chat with uh, my information on it. Uh, we are tied up in Baltimore right now, but Omar, I do want to do something in Charleston and uh, certainly want to do something in uh, Newark. I was born in New Jersey. I've talked to uh, the, the Senator about that and would love Anna to connect with you guys as well. So I, I guess the last thing I would say is that part of the strategy going forward should be encouraging and funding technologies that assist communities that are really focused on how to make communities safer and how to protect them from uh, climate change and how to reduce their need to be resilient. And uh, we're, I'm fortunate that we have a process that I think can accomplish that, but there needs to be more. And all the federal funding is really targeted towards uh, sort of uh, other types of technologies that don't necessarily benefit communities directly. So that would be my input. And the last thing I'll say, Sokobi, is that I hope you'll create a session next year for entrepreneurs like myself to be able to share what we're doing and to engage with communities that we'd like to work with. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Thank you for that. Uh, I think we want to be solution focused, and I think that's a great idea. I mean, one of the sessions that we're having, I know we're, we're getting low on time, this year is talking about air pollution sensors. So we're, we want to bring more technology, you know, the you know, uh, futuristic technologies to, to these current problems. So that's something definitely we will, we will definitely do, maybe sooner than next, next year's symposium, uh, Joe. One, if, if, does someone have a quick question? Because we got to transition to close. Uh, Joe has put other Joe, uh, my Joe, <laughs> both staff has put in a link to the uh, to the closing session. But th is there a, a quick question to a panelists before we go transition to the closing? Jacoby, I, I just wanted to say something else really quickly. I swear that all of my research and publications speaks to community centered pragmatic solutions. <laughs> that speaks to a lot of what everybody has said. I was just in a different bag today. I, I, I felt some kind of way today. So I talked about different things, but just wanted to put that out there. Oh, no, no, we gotta, we gotta be transdisciplinary. And we gotta have real talk, y'all. We, this, this, we're talking about environmental justice. This is real talk. This is not fake talk. So we have to talk about the, some of the real issues. So I appreciate, you know, you having the real talk today. Uh, anyway, else before we transition to, uh, I do want to call out Bonita's great comment about reclaiming the heritage of farmers and local economic systems and BIPOC indigenous communities. I, I think it was, uh, uh, maybe it was uh, Anna uh, who said it, uh, some of the stuff she said, and, and maybe Kareem, but just this idea and this green infrastructure. We know about green infrastructure. Yo, we could be talking about this agriculture. Digging Booker T. Washington and other, some other folks bringing agriculture back to communities. And not just talking about urban communities, also rural communities. You have agriculture, but you have regenerative agriculture. Do you have sustainable agriculture? Do you have climate uh, resilient agriculture, right? That to me is part of the solution. When you think about the, I'm, I'm gonna close this out. When you think about the food, energy, water nexus, right? Agriculture, green infrastructure is an important way. So we gotta bring, we gotta change zoning. 
We got to change highways and byways to greenways. We got to have green roofs and green walls. We got to have people growing food. So they have to go to five bus stops to get a grocery store. So they're not no longer dealing with food apartheid. Growing food in your own neighborhood is part of food sovereignty, which also can lend to energy sovereignty, right? Which can also lend to water sovereignty. We got to have a human rights framework in this work, y'all. So when we think about climate change, bring in human rights, bring in sovereignty. Whoever we talked about before, you know, the, the, oh, that was on it, the co-ops. Yes, yes, energy co-ops, food co-ops, water co-ops. Let's do it ourselves because the government is not doing it, hasn't been doing it, and that's how I'm, I'm, I'm real about Wakanda. Make Wakanda <laughs> by doing food co-ops, energy co-ops, and water co-ops. Get our dollars. That's your taxpayers' money. Bring that money to invest in communities in a real, substantive, community-driven way. Like you said, Vincent, community only manage of the community, for the community, and by the community. That's what EJ is about, y'all. So I'm, I'm gonna stop. I'm getting excited. So get get back in the closing. I'm, I'm getting too loud. Go close, hit the link. I'm gonna close this out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Shakobi. Thank you. Thank you, again. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. We can win. We can. We can win. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.